On the 29th day of October, Halloween gave to me 29 veteran seancing, 28 whispering walls, 27 slugs a slinking, 26 hot dog ghosts, 25 hitchhiking ghouls, 24 soggy corpses, 23 shadow scraping, 22 Egyptian eyeballs, 21 acid rays, 20 creepy stalkers, 19 Kiernan's time traveling, 18 zombie swatting, 17 Kettner screeching, 16 flying engines, 15 workplace accidents, 14 logs of bouncing, 13 planes exploding, 12 zombie soldiers, 11 angels wrestling, 10 ghostly hitchhikers, 9 basement clowns, 8 vampire cruises, 7 silent heroes, 6 prequel bloodstones, 5 diabolical fledglings, 4 vampire pianists, 3 dead professors, 2 Michelle actresses, and a radu drooling something bloody. Hey everyone, welcome to the 31 Days of Halloween. We've only got three more of these to go uh, before the big day. So I am excited that you are here. Let's get to it. We are talking today about Brooklyn 45. This is a film by Ted Gojgen, Gojgen, Georgian, uh, <laughs> a, a gentleman with a lot of talent and a difficult to pronounce name, uh, G-E-O-G-H-E-G-A-N. It's a lot of G's. Gyojin. Gyojin? Let's go with that. So, uh, Brooklyn 45 is one of the things I love most in this world, which is a parlor ghost story. And I'm going to, there are slight spoilers here for the setup of the movie. I'm not going to go further than the setup, but that is going to include one beat that if you just, I, and I recommend watching Brooklyn, Brooklyn 45. There's one beat that if you don't want anything about this movie spoiled at all, then just go watch the movie. Uh, if you don't mind one slight small spoiler with how this movie kicks off, then that is as far as I'm going to go. We are not going to get deep, deep into all the twists and turns of this movie. Um, and, and there are some. Uh, but when I say a parlor ghost story, there is something, uh, and maybe this goes back to that Peter Straub novel, and, and even before that, right, this is a, a literary trope, the idea of some people sitting down in a, in a parlor and telling a ghost story. And that's kind of what you have in this film, although it's literally a parlor and, and it's kind of the genius of the movie, I think, is that it, it traps its characters in a single room. And the thing that is wonderful about that is a... That gives you license to, uh, you know, contain your characters and build tension and all that kind of stuff. But it also gives you license to not spend a ton of money. You know, you get to just, uh, you know, make your movie uh, in one room and not spend a ton of uh, time and money with other setups. Uh, you know, uh, setups meaning setting up your camera and your lights and, and all the electrical and things like that. You've got one, you know, set that you're dealing with and, you know, in television, those are called button episodes because, uh, if they are self-contained, they don't cost a lot of money. They're, they're, uh, episodes meant to give cast and crew and budget a little bit of a break. But what this movie does is it takes that kind of button episode mentality and it uses all of that, you know, sort of lack of grandeur to explore a very intimate story. And, and that's ultimately what Brooklyn 45, I think, is, is a very intimate story. And the, the idea is that you have uh, Larry Fessenden, a uh, horror stalwart, the guy who launched uh, a thousand. I mean, he's. I was going to say he's kind of the modern day Roger Corman, but I think his movies are generally better than Corman's and less cynical than Corman's. Like Larry Fessenden, I feel like always sets out to make a, a very good movie. And I think Roger Corman f falls on both sides of that line where sometimes he's trying to make a great movie with all the post stuff. I think those are intended to be great movies and tend to be great movies. And I think there is that side of Fessenden, and I think there is the other side of Fessenden, or uh, Corman, and I think there's the other side of Corman, 
who just wants to turn a buck. And Fessenden, I'm sure, wants to make money, but I also think that Fessenden wants to always kind of swing for the fences in terms of quality. And as a result of that, I think Fessenden, the, the Corman comparison falls a little flat. But it, it is something, there is some similar DNA in that they're both working outside the studio system. They're both making movies that are particular to a certain audience and a certain sensibility. And so Fessenden, who also had a hand in producing this movie, uh, is playing Lieutenant Colonel Clive Hawksetter, Hawk as everyone calls him. And he is uh, fresh off the war, as are most of the characters in this movie. And he has recently lost his wife, who we learn in the first few minutes what was a woman who was deeply troubled. She had a lot of mental illness and ended up uh, killing herself. And that has sent Hawk spiraling. So everyone has gathered together for this, you know, sort of pre-Christmas dinner where they're all going to have some drinks and they're going to talk. And Hawk has called them all together. They, they don't know exactly why, but they're there for their friend. They all went through the war together. There's uh, Marla Sheridan and Bob Sheridan. Bob is a recent uh, entry into the group. He married Marla. Marla, played by Ann Ramsey, who you might remember best. She's been in everything. All of these actors have been in everything. But you might remember Ann Ramsey best. She was the daughter of Deborah Logan in The Taking of Deborah Logan. And Ann Ramsey is fantastic in this. And she plays a character who was an interrogator in the war. And everyone has a lot of respect for Marla. The fact that she was ruthless when she was interrogating people in the war. Even though in this movie she acts as a bit of a voice of conscience. Uh, but she definitely has her demons, as all these people do. And that's a big theme of the movie, is the, the lingering trauma of war. There's Jeremy Holm, who plays Archibald Stanton, Archie. And he is facing a trial back home for uh, war crimes, essentially. He's facing a court-martial because he was accused of uh, you know, throwing a grenade into a hospital where there were children. And he says, no, 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 I didn't do that. Uh, that. That wasn't me. I would never do such a thing. Then you have Ezra Buzzington, who is, I mean, he's got one of those faces. You'll know him when you see him. He played one of the monsters in The Hills Have Eyes. He was in uh, Fight Club. He w recently was in The Fablemans. Uh, he's been in Doom Patrol. Uh, he's just been everywhere. Like All of these actors are character actors that have been in everything. It's one of the things that makes this movie great is that every actor in it is someone who has been doing it forever and they're just great. And putting them all together in this movie, even though none of them are essentially a, a big name, they're all good and, and they're good together. And as a result, you get great performances across the board and these really interesting interactions with each other. It's so smart. Ted Gojan, Gojgan is is so smart in casting character actors. It's something I'm a big proponent of, uh, is don't go for a name, go for good actors, and and that's going to make your movie great. And and that's kind of what he's done here. So Ezra Bu Buzzington is uh, Major DeFranco, and DeFranco was a big friend of Hawks, is incredibly loyal to him, and is a real hard line, right? Like, he, he feels... In, in a modern equivalent, he feels like that ultra right-wing person that you know that is very anti-immigration and uh, very just incredibly conservative, you know, for better or worse. And then finally, the rounding out the cast is Christina Kleb, or Kleb. Uh, she is a first-generation German uh, actress her parents were German. She's first generation American. And you would know her from any video game you've ever played. She does an, an incredible amount of voice work. She was also in that uh, Halloween 08 
uh, uh, movie, the, the Rob Zombie uh, Halloween, as Linda. And uh, has, you know, just, uh, again, been in everything. Uh, the one that blew me away when I was looking through her credits is she's one of the voices in Rainbow Six Siege. And I was like, wow, she really does it all. She was did voices for Wolfenstein 2 and Friday the 13th, the video game, and was in uh, the that recent Hellboy remake as Lenny Raffenstahl. Just, uh, it, like, everything. Everything. She's been in everything. And she's uh, terrific in this. So... Let's get to back to our setup because it's Larry Fessenden uh, calls all these old friends of his together with the exception of uh, Christina Club's character. Hildegard Bauman is her name, but we'll get to her in a second. So he calls everybody together and he gives this speech. God, I love, in addition to a parlor ghost story, another thing I dearly love is when you have a character that's suffering this emotional trauma as Hawk is following the death of his wife. And he's like, you know, I went to church and that turned out to be a bunch of bullshit. So what I decided to do is explore the occult. And I want to bring everybody together because I want to ask you a favor. I want us to hold a seance. I need to know that my wife is alive. And I've read enough about from these books that I've been reading and collecting that I believe... Um, I should be able to contact them with your help. If we all sit down and hold hands and, and call out to the spirits, I, I need to know. I need to know that there's something else. I need to know that she's still out there. And everyone's real skeptical of it, but they finally agree to do it. And he lays down one important rule, which is we have to close the door uh, and, and say goodbye to the spirits before we're done. Otherwise, we're opening a door to the spirits and we're not closing it. And they conduct the seance. The seance goes positively, one would say, uh, in the sense that there is definitely a sign of ghostly activity. And then... Uh, the, everybody breaks away because everybody gets freaked out because they hear uh, the voice of uh, Susan, the, the wife who has uh, killed herself. And Hawk is like, well, that did it. I know that she's out there now. I appreciate everybody for coming. Please excuse me for a moment. And he takes a gun, puts it in his mouth, and shoots himself in the head and collapses face forward onto the table where they were just conducting this seance. And everyone freaks out, obviously, but it, it makes sense, right, for Hawk, because he now knows that there is another side to reality, and he's going to go join his wife. That's what he wanted, and, and that's what he gets. And while everybody is freaking out about this, they hear something coming from the closet, which they've heard a couple of times. They open the closet door, and there is Hildegard tied up in the closet. And they let her out, and she tells them, hey, I own, or I work at a grocery store down the street. My family owns it. I've got two kids waiting for me at home. The Hockstatters were crazy people who Lucy, uh, sorry, not Lucy, that's the actress's name, uh, Lucy Carap Carapachin, who plays Susan. Susan Hockstatter, in her mental illness, started accusing Hildegard of being a Nazi spy. Uh, at first... Hawk thought that was all bullshit, but when she killed herself, Hawk basically bought into this delusion that Hildegard was a spy because it meant that his wife wasn't just mentally ill. It meant like, oh, she had this knowledge that no one else believed, and, and because no one believed her, she killed herself. And I'm going to set things right. And so where, where the movie takes off is when all of these characters are suddenly now trapped in a room because, because they never closed the door and Hawk is now dead, they don't, uh, they, they are not allowed to leave the room. The ghosts, the spirits are now, um, keeping them in this room until somebody kills Hildegard. That is the direction from the spirit world, AKA Hawk and his wife who are now the spirits holding them inside this room. You have to kill this spy 
And once you do that, the, the doors will unlock and you can go about your business. And the rest of the movie is them sort of debating, is she a spy? Should we do this even if she's not a spy so that we can get out of here? How do we prove that she is or is not a spy? And through the course of that, also this past trauma of like, here's what happened in the war to all of these characters. And here is why some of them are still stuck in the war. Some of them are very actively trying to put it behind them. And and some of them are, are ignoring it completely. They're like, you know, everything w- was hunky-dory. Like, we, we did nothing but heroic things in the war. And now that we're home, we're heroes. And that is not... That's not the case of war. Like, war is just not that simple. And the the Hollywood version of going to war and coming home... I mean, these days it's more reflective, right? I think that that's sort of changed with... You know, Paths of Glory is probably one of the first ones that I can recall that really took the sheen, the the romanticism off of the, the notion of war and war uh, heroism. And things like Saving Private Ryan and, you know, the the Big Red One. And like uh, there are a number of movies. And then, of course, Band of Brothers and The Pacific. And, you know, there, there's there been a number of examples in popular modern media that showed the war, you know, warts and all. And, and its effects on, on people. And combining that ethos with this ghost story, this parlor ghost story. And, and, you know, because horror movies that work at their best when they are morality tales. And this is such a pure morality tale. The, this idea of you have to take this woman's life who may or may not be a villain in fairness. She may be a spy who worked for the Nazis. And if that was the case, then killing her is somewhat justified, but she is also a wife and a mother who wants to get home to her kids and she may have nothing at all to do with the war. And if that's the case, because according to her, they fled Germany uh, ahead of Hitler's rise to power. They are immigrants to the country. They, the only reason she was found in that closet is because Susan Hochstetter was a crazy person and Hawk, the Hawk, the, the husband bought into that delusion because of the death of his wife, that he he became unhinged as well. And that is the movie, you know? And there are ghostly doings. It's not just uh, th- this morality play. There, there are still supernatural things afoot. But all of that is in service to the, the greater theme of the movie, which is, like, when you leave the war, can you truly ever leave it behind? The things that happen to you in war are things that you cannot escape that they will either come back to find you or you never really left in the first place and all of the characters represent some example of how the war uh, traumatically affects them after leaving the theater of combat and it's so well done and it's so well acted and it lands on just the right note where it's very not even bittersweet it's just bitter but you know, in in a way that suggests that some of these characters are moving forward, but it's still unhappily. It, it, you know, the the idea that no matter what you do, that you can't escape the the horrors of war, even after the war. You know, you are done with the war, but the war's not done with you. And it's very sad and and touching in a lot of ways but also heartbreaking it, it's just such a, a well done and well constructed bit of ghost story storytelling where all of this stuff matters you know the thing it reminded me most of as i was watching it was flanagan's haunting of hill house uh where so much of that show is about family trauma and the the loss of a family member in you know with, being couched in all the, of these supernatural happenings and this is that same kind of thing and maybe my favorite Fessenden performance by the way because it's so restrained he's not you know goofy Larry Fessenden he is very like he's a lieutenant colonel and he is very 
uh, self-possessed and and quiet and contemplative. And but, but there's always that thing that that's underneath Fessenden at all times, where it's like, oh, he could go crazy any minute. And there is that sense that Hawk is just barely holding his shit together. And Fessenden is great at at uh, exhibiting that. And you know, uh, just across the board, like every performance is a good performance. And taken as a whole, like this is a movie that is not just the sum of its parts, but every piece of it, all, all of those parts are good. And the sum of those parts is something I think that's kind of a special movie. Uh, I don't know, it, like it's so small and, and, and self-contained that it's hard to say that it's, you know, the, like this grand movie event, but everything about it works. And what it is, is exactly what it intends to be. It, it does uh, what it wants efficiently. The only complaint I would have with it is once you have your setup, which we've talked about, the journey to get to the ending can be, uh, it, it, it can feel a little bit soggy in the middle, but I, I don't think that I really had a problem with any of that because I was so into the characters and watching these actors really chew on these performances that even though a lot, there's not a lot that, that narratively is happening in the middle. There's so much that's happening with the characters in the middle that I didn't feel uh, like, like we were spinning our wheels. And again, there's enough ghostly stuff that goes on that things, you know, keep moving and it's not terribly long. So if you uh, are a Shudder subscriber, I know it is on Shudder. I think you can get it other places as well. But Brooklyn 45 is a great ghost story. I like, put it on. It is not a feel-good movie necessarily, but is definitely a, a good, creepy ghost story that has a lot of uh, thematic resonance. And I, I really, really liked it. Uh, I know a lot of people really love We Are Still Here, uh, which is also a ghost story uh, from Ted Gojigan. And I like We Are Still Here. I like Brooklyn 45 a bunch more. Even though We Are Still Here is probably a more pure ghost story, I really like Brooklyn 45. It's it, one of my favorite movies of the year, I think. I th it's just, it's so much fun uh, seeing all these actors do their thing. And, and yeah, I just love it. I really do. I think it's a terrific movie. Anyway, please, if you have seen... Brooklyn 45, drop into the Discord. Uh, there are links on the post on legionpodcast.com. Drop into the Discord. Let me know what you thought about uh, about Brooklyn 45. Uh, I am interested to talk to others who have seen it, and, and hopefully uh, you enjoyed it as much as I did. Well, speaking of enjoying things, we've got two more movies to go. Uh, both of them bangers, because that's how we do on here. We don't, we don't do our last four or five days talking about movies that aren't any good. We're talking about good stuff. And uh, so we are going uh, to talk about a couple of great films on our way out uh, up to and including on Halloween. So it's the last weekend of the Halloween season. I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you're enjoying the cooler weather. If you got it, the leaves falling, the the ghosts a ghosting, the trick-or-treaters uh, putting the final touches on their costumes. And uh, yeah, have yourselves an amazing final October weekend, and I'll see you tomorrow for day 30 of the 31 days of Halloween. See you then.